<laughs> Morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK, cool. Well, thanks for coming. I, I didn't think anyone would be here. I thought everyone would be over with Chris Lema. So uh, yeah. what's that? Yeah, right. That's a good point, actually, a good point. Yeah, a good point. So yeah, thanks for coming. Today, the talk is going to be on getting good clients and avoiding crappy clients. And uh, the theme of the, or the title is Conjuring Up Good Clients and How to Avoid Evil Clients. Um, I tried to title the presentation to align with the theme of the WordCamp. It seems like I was the only one to do that when I looked at the schedule. <laughs> so hopefully you understood what it meant. So Chris Ford, increase your dexterity. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm not the, not, the, not the only one. So conjuring up good clients. When I, when I was uh, putting together the presentation, I was thinking the word conjuring. Conjuring means to make something happen magically. And when I, when I focus on business development, the very first thing in getting clients and getting good in clients and growing the business, I always start with intentions. And I don't know if anybody's ever worked with intentions, which kind of precede goals. Intentions are actually pretty powerful and actually magical. Intentions ultimately turn into um, action steps. They turn into pro uh, projections. They turn into processes. So we always start with our intentions. As, as a marketing team, we're continually a, a kind of rehoning our attention, intentions based on what's happening in reality. So the word conjuring is a kind of a very applicable word. And eluding evil clients, it's probably the most important thing to not only grow a business, but to keep a business afloat. I, when I look at the darkest times in the history of my business, it's almost always related to a bad client or a bad project or many bad projects. Those times when I really wanted to quit or those times when I wanted to shut down the company, and so it's really encouraged me and motivated me to continually focus on not only getting good clients, but avoiding bad clients. And it's actually relatively, uh, it's fairly relative. So someone's trash is another person's treasure. So a good client for me might be a bad client for someone else, and a bad client for someone else might be a good client for me. So it's really important. <coughs> hey, it's not working, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I'm going to get into for sure. Yeah, right on. Okay. So I, really identifying those good clients, I, I call it identifying your sweet spot is really what, what's a good client for you and what's a bad client for you. Um, so I actually have a, couple of, uh, I have a couple of categories I want to focus on. The first one is geographics, which is, seems like it's not really a big deal. But you know, we're based in San Diego, so most of our clients are in San Diego just because of logistics and a lot of our targeted marketing is focused on San Diego. When I'm, when I'm working with a potential client in San Diego or trying to get a potential client in San Diego, I really play up the fact that we're a local company. And it, we, it doesn't really make that much of a difference because most of the work is done virtually and remotely, but it really makes a big difference during the sales process. And I always try to meet with prospective clients during the, when I'm, versus doing it over the phone. And a other, couple other things about uh, geographics, we typically, only work with clients in the United States. We've done overseas projects, but what we typically find is simple things like the time zones, the currency, the language, all those things make the project that, that much more difficult. So for, as, as a rule of thumb, we don't work with clients who are overseas. We'll take on clients in Canada, but then again, just the currency exchange makes our, makes our websites and our projects that much more expensive, so we don't get that much work in Canada. Well, again, we're trying to make things as easy as possible. Um, second thing is type, types and sizes of the companies. Our sweet spot, as a rule of thumb, is companies that are growing with two to twenty million dollars in revenues. We definitely do projects that are smaller, and we'll definitely work with companies that are bigger. But that's kind of our sweet spot. And in terms of the types of companies, they're usually service-based companies. And we do e-commerce sites. Um, third thing, and this is the most important thing in the entire presentation, is the type of personality or the personality of the person we're potentially going to work with. We have a, two or three people who qualify leads when they come in. And we have one main thing we're asking ourselves, was it a nice person? 
I know, again, it's fairly subjective to the person who's qualifying them. But if someone's an asshole, everybody can tell pretty quickly. And we get plenty of those types of those prospects coming in. They're either impatient or they're rude or they're, or they're pushy. In that case, even if it seems like it's a perfect project, if, if they're an asshole in any way, shape, or form, we will avoid that uh, project. And then again, if it's a project that may not be a good fit, if they're really, really nice, we'll actually can give the project some consideration. So that's like the most important thing. We made the decision like two or three years ago. Because I used to have this philosophy is I'll take on any project for any client. And, I, and then I'd end up getting bit in the ass because the person who I knew was going to be a pain ended up being a pain. And it's difficult sometimes, especially if you're trying to grow your business, to turn away a prospective client just based on their personality. But it's probably the most important thing you can do early on. And it's, it's just really a kind of a habit. Once you establish that habit of saying, I'm not going to work with those types of clients because of they, you know, for, so, what, for some reason, they didn't, I didn't have a connection with them, or we didn't, you know, I didn't get a good feeling for them, I would always go with your gut with that. And our, as a result of that, our business has really grown in a really good way. Not only that, but you know, not, I'm not the one who has to deal with them. Our project managers, our designers, our strategists, our developers, they're the people who have to deal with them. And they're, if they're not happy, they make my life miserable. So it's really important to me to bring, bring good clients in. Um, types of services. So we, as a rule of thumb, um, we, can, we have a really good development team. We have good designers. But we typically do marketing websites, and we do e smaller e-commerce websites. Even though we can do bigger, complicated websites, even though we can do like graphic projects and branding projects, we typically stay away from those. We have a relatively tight kind of wheelhouse that we focus on. And as a result of kind of having that intention of saying, this is the type of project that we're focusing on, plenty of leads kind of magically come in that way. And we turn away the ones that aren't a good fit, and especially the ones that are complicated. So one of the things I ask my developers when they're speaking to, you know, if we bring them in to talk about a project that seems a little bit more complicated, we ask how much customization is involved in that project. If there's over minimal customization, even though they say we could do this, I will, say, I will pretty much turn it away. Because if you tie up your resources in a project like that, especially if it involves customization, you never know. You could go down a rabbit hole on something that's really small, really easy, and eat up a lot of time. We're actually we, we're in a project like this right now. We have 200 hours into a project that we quoted for 50 hours. So, and, it, and this is something we th didn't think would be a big deal. And we're able to get another 50 hours, pay them for 50, you know, another, get them to pay for another 50 hours. But, but essentially, we're not only going to lose money, but we have two of our developers tied into a project for weeks and weeks. So it's just not, it's just not worth it. Got to get rid of something here. Um, sir, uh, the last thing is RFPs. Uh, I, we typically avoid RFPs. The only reason we'll deal with an R take, consider an RFP. It's happening again, Mike. The only reason we'll consider an RFP is if I know the person who's sending the RFP, RFP out, if they're, a client, if they're a client, or if I know them pretty well. And then a <coughs> request for proposal. Yeah. And then even if it is someone I know, I ask one question. How many companies are they inviting? If they're inviting over four companies, we did, we'll bow out. Because you put so, you know, those requests require you to do things that are much more than a typical proposal. So you could put 10 hours into a project and have a 5% chance of getting it. It's just not worth it for us. No, no, no. Can you do it on the computer itself? Do you just put No, no. Oh, oh. Is there a story behind the hanging frog hand? Do you know how many times I get asked that? <laughs> I get no, I mean that's, I'm not I'm not berating for asking, but I get asked that all the time. The answer is the answer is not really. <laughs> yeah. It's kinda cool. You, you just had to have a name and then it, there it is. I was I basically wanted to have a name that people wouldn't forget. That was the first thing. The second thing I wanted an animal that people liked. I thought you were working and a little tiny frog jumped up on top. No, that would be I wish that was the case. No, it that is wasn't. Now. Yeah. Story. Yeah. So I, I actually had one I have this saying like everyone loves frogs, and I got this client in Bermuda that broke my rule, actually, not working with clients locally. And um, I said, everyone loves frogs. And she, her sister got bit by a poisonous frog from Bermuda. <laughs> and she almost died. So she said, I'm the first. I, I, don't, I hate frogs. 
I, got, I still got the project, but I, I, now I kind of have a story. You can have a second, second company poisonous frog later. later. Well, this is, a po this is a poisonous frog. You wouldn't want to just hang out with this frog. Yeah. OK, so once, once, you, um, once you've decided what your sweet spot is, and it's, not, it's, it's always adjusting depending on your skills, your resources, your availability. Um, I, the main point with that is just don't get desperate. Try to determine and discern what you're willing to do and try to be, have the, the will to not do those things you know aren't a good fit for you, if that makes sense. So I want to talk a little bit about establishing effective lead channels. I mean, leads are critical. You could be an amazing, you could have an be amazing designer, an amazing developer. You could be an amazing salesperson. You could have everything perfect, but if you're not getting the leads or the potential clients coming in, you're pretty much not going to go anywhere. So if, just establishing effective lead channels is really important. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a small marketing department. I have someone, Jessica, are you here, Jessica? Oh, she's our marketing director in the back. Um, and she's really, really incredible. Best decision I ever made. And um, you're welcome. And, uh, and she has a couple people who kind of work under her um, to one degree or another. But so marketing is a huge focus for us. My background was sales. I'd spent um, 10 years in corporate sales, and I'd started this business in 2003. So I'd had very little experience with marketing. And plus, I'm not a very patient person. And plus, I'm not a very detailed person, which does not make a really good marketing person which every, she's both of those things, you know, quite a bit. But what, we folk, what we've done, we probably get on an average week about 20 to 40 leads, depending on a number of different things. And um, most of those projects we end up turning away because of the fact that we have, you know, that sweet spot that I'm, I'm, I mentioned. But what we, the things that we do that, to bring leads in, and most of these are kind of like long tail strategies. First thing is content marketing. We're always developing really good content. We have a couple good writers who come in as contractors to write uh, ideas. We're always brainstorming about ideas for topics. Once we have a good piece, we'll do one of three things with it. We'll either put it on our website. Um, we'll try to get, we have connections with some you know, bigger websites and editors and bigger websites, and we submit those. And what, the more you submit, you know, eventually you'll get them in, and it seems to be really helpful for us in terms of not only getting traffic back to our site, but getting the link back to our site, and, uh, and also just helps our, just our organic ranking in general. Um, we'll, you know, we'll do PR submissions as well, which seems to be really helpful. And it's really difficult to kind of um, associate this, this, these content pieces with specific leads. But in general, the amount of leads that we have coming in is growing signif significantly, and we know this has played an important role. We do a lot of video content. We have a lot of video. We, on a weekly basis, we post a video on our website, basically kind of a you know, tips and advice video. It takes a lot of work to do it, but it really pays off in a number of different ways. I have potential clients who will come to me, and they say, I've been watching your videos for weeks or months or whatever. So when they were ready to make a decision to look for a web you know, a company, we were instantly um, one of their first choices because we had developed trust and credibility with them, even though we had never actually have, never actually talked to them. We do stuff with social media. We're really focusing on paid social media now. Does anyone know uh, Gary Vander Vanderchuk? You know, he, he talks about that all the time, Gary V. And uh, I've only recently been introduced to him, but he talks about social media. It's like buying property in Malibu in 1963. It's so cheap. It's like Google AdWords back in 2002. Um, the cost per acquisition and getting that kind of exposure is really cost effective. You have to know what you're doing, and that's what we're learning right now, but that's, that's our next really big, really big push. Um, directory sites and reviews. Is anybody posting stuff to directory sites at all or putting pro building profiles into directory sites? The two ones that we use and get a lot of traffic from are UpCity and Clutch. Um, getting a good profile and getting a lot of reviews on those makes a huge, huge difference. Not only that, but we use, I'm actually going to talk about how we use the reviews in other ways as well. Just organic and paid search. We, um, we have an organic SEO company and a, a paid search company that we use, but we use them for strategy and consulting. For the, they help a little bit with the campaigns, but mainly we strategize with them because nobody has your interests, the best interests like you do. So what we're doing is we're learning from them. We're kind of adapting our strategies based on the results and getting their feedback. And you know, Jessica and anybody you know, who's involved in the campaigns, they'll learn. Plus, we're learning how to do it on our own. We keep our costs down. We have control of our messaging. We're learning about how to do it. So I think, it's, I think learning this stuff, you know, trying to learn all that stuff just by watching YouTube videos and 
you know, going to blogs can be limiting. If you can find companies you can, you, get, you can hire on a strategy basis, you can get a much better deal than actually having them do the work. And I know a lot of SEO companies, and when they work for their clients, their work, the work they do is, is okay, but I think if the company was more involved, the work would get, would get much better. Um, networking, and we don't do too much networking now compared to you know, when I started the business, but as a result of all the networking I did early on, I've established a lot of referral partners. And I have five or six companies who give us probably about 25% of our leads, and they're really good leads because they already have a connection with the client. So in terms of networking, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of going out and trying to find a website project from networking. My networking, when I used to do more networking, it was more focused on finding a company that had clients that could refer to us. And as a result of that, I, I've, has anyone ever heard the term power partners? Yeah, that's what I, I would focus on. Power, yeah, companies that are in not direct competitors that are in industries. We have three or four SEO companies who refer us work, for example. And those are really good power partners for us. We don't do digital marketing, so we're not competition, um, but they, and they, you know, they may or may not do what we do, but you know, they oftentimes will need help in those areas. And then um, uh, client referrals, obviously, that's kind of like the low-hanging fruit. The, you know, there's a saying you can't get if you don't ask. So we're you know, continually asking our clients for referrals. And just, again, staying on top of mind, we, we've sent, we put out a monthly newsletter that obviously all of our clients can have access to. Um, we, when we have the time, we do client follow-up. And the more you stay in front of them, when they have someone say, hey, I love your website, I'm looking, you know, looking for a website, or if they're anywhere and someone talks about websites, you know, if, we have, if they had a good experience with us and we're staying on top of mind, there's a very good chance to refer us. And we get you know, a good handful of referrals every week from our, from our existing clients. Um, is anyone using live chat on their website No. A couple? Uh, we, we started using live chat. How long ago was that, Jessica? Maybe six, eight months ago? So since we started using live chat, our leads have gr gone up dramatically. It was the best, in, best single thing we did to increase our leads. Because people who were already on our website, who potentially wouldn't have reached out to us if we didn't have live chat on our website. So we went through a process of kind of evaluating different live chat options. We ended up going with, I think, live chat. And um, we figured out over a period of time how to use it most effectively. So the way we use live chat is to get someone on the phone. So that we ask them like one or two questions to kind of, kind of understand what they're looking for. And then we'll say something like, or whoever, we have three people who do the chat. They'll say something like, that's a really good question. Why don't we jump on a call real quick? And 80% of the time, they will jump on a call. And then all of a sudden, it turns it from something, you know, a nominal lead into a potentially really good lead. And um, you have to have, obviously, you have to have people who can man the live chat, but if you're not around, just turn it off. If you can man it, if you have it on your website and you can man it for an hour a day, that's better than nothing. If you can man it for a couple hours a day, it's, it's, uh, it's better than nothing. We have a lot of clients, I'll say, you should consider using live chat. And they'll say, I just don't, we don't have the resources or the time to be able to man it. Um, you don't have to have it on all the time. If you can, obviously, the more the better, but something is better than nothing. So it's, a, it's probably the second thing. In terms of avoiding clients who are jerks, this is probably the second most important thing I could probably convey over the course of this presentation. And then email marketing. We, just, we have uh, you know, regular emails that go out to our clients. So, but to anybody who contacts us in ever, any way, shape, or form, they go on to our email list. And I'll get, again, I'll have companies who will contact us and they'll say, I've been getting your newsletter now for years. And I was, we, we're finally in a position to be able to do something, so they contact us because we had been continually, you know, educating and being an ongoing resource for them. Mm, bummer. I'm glad you're not back there. Yeah. Is it because it's a MacBook Air? Is your computer is your display setting up? No. How about I just do it manually? I don't mind. But can I just do it manually? Take that out? Yeah. If we take that out, I can do it manually? Okay. Oh. Is it working manually? Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk, talk about tracking leads. Obviously, if you're getting leads come in, it's probably a really good thing to track where those leads are coming from and how effective those leads are. So uh, we, ha we do a pretty good job at tracking leads, or at least she does a pretty good job at tracking leads. So we're always focusing on conversion. So we're driving leads to you know, certain pages on our websites. We're continually building landing pages, driving leads to the landing pages. 
And we're continually moder modifying our website to optimize the conversion rates. And it's made a huge difference. We probably, it's, we kind of have this joke about how often we're changing our website and adding pages to our website and adding landing pages. But it takes time and it takes energy and it's difficult if you're a one person you know, shop to be able to do those types of things. But if you're spending time and money and resources and energy towards getting leads to your website, it, it certainly makes a, it would make a big difference to do, spend that little bit of extra time to make sure you're doing whatever you can to make sure those leads that are coming in, tracking how they're coming in. And um, we, we obviously use analytics, an, analytics, but uh, we're always looking at the channels in terms of the way the leads are coming in. It's interesting how certain channels will direct certain leads to our website, like Yelp. We get leads from Yelp um, because we have a pretty big profile on there. Most of the leads that come from, from Yelp are really small companies and they're too small. For, and not all the time, every once in a while we'll get a really good lead from Yelp. That's why we continue to use it as a kind of a directory and invest in that. But most of the leads that come in from there, and if we weren't tracking that, we wouldn't be able to kind of discern or ascertain that. And then if a, uh, if a marketing channel is effective because of the fact that we're tracking, we'll put more energy into it. And that Google AdWords is a good example. We're continually running Google AdWords campaigns and tweaking our ads and tweaking the landing pages they're, they're going to and adding more keywords. And because of the fact that we're tracking the leads and we're looking at the analytics and we're looking at the results, that really helps us to get the most of our money. Because every company, big or small, has a certain marketing budget they can work with. And you really have to get the most out of that budget. Your budget may be $500 a month. Your budget might be you know, $500,000 a month. Whatever it is, you have to get the most out of that budget. That's why, especially for a, co a smaller company, it's really important to look at where those leads are coming and what you can do to either make those channels more effective or or get rid of them. And it, it, you have to really give it time. You have to wait for a marketing channel to, to mature. You have to wait to see if it, you know, you have to make those moderations and adjustments and revisions to make sure it is actually a channel that's worth pursuing. Sometimes we make, sometimes, it's interesting, you make one minor tweak to something, all of a sudden it turns an ineffective marketing channel into a really good marketing channel. And the best case scenario is to have leads coming in from, as many, we probably have eight or nine different kind of sources, whether it be client referrals or power partners or Google AdWords or organic or directories or content marketing or social media, or whatever. So we have like eight or nine channels which marketing is, you know, leads are flowing to our business. So if one, you know, channel were to, you know, go south or whatever, it would have a minimal impact on everything. If you have one source, let's say you have one power partner that's giving you all your, bus your business and that person dies you're gonna be SOL. So it's really important to have as many different marketing channels as possible. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, just a question. really helpful to understand in terms of your budget for marketing. Like what is your sort of overall spend and in terms of the you think your client committed? Well, there's direct costs and then there's uh, a fixed costs. Like we have a marketing department which has employees. So you know, that's, that's our biggest expense by far. Um, beyond that, it's actually relatively minimal because of the fact that we have good people in our marketing department who are working on keeping the cost down, doing a lot of the work on the own. And, and I think that's a better way to go. I know, I know companies out there, they'll pay higher SEO, social media, PR, and they'll pay $25,000 a month when they could have like three really good employees and they could probably spend $2,000 a month or you know, minimize that. Really so, good limo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Would you be kind enough back, that, back up just one sec? Back slides up? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I found it's best to do as much as you can on your own and keeping your marketing spend down. We spend, it's pretty nominal actually, maybe $2,500 a month, which is, you know, not a lot for. So, so, you, got it. so you're, you're saying, and I agree with that, you're saying that really the, the personnel and people actually in your own company doing the marketing is what makes the spend the most effective. Absolutely. Because yeah. if you don't have anyone looking at that right. and doing some work and working with and doing some, actually doing some of the legwork. I mean, you're gonna have to, it's either you're gonna do it or you're gonna pay someone to do it, or you're not gonna do it. One of the three things. Well, I do it and I can't afford to pay someone to do it, so often I don't. <laughs> That's a problem. That's why you have to, you have to find more time, probably. Right. Yeah. Or, that, or you, can, you can do little things, like hire someone to do some of the you know, minimal work. Anything you, I mean, you only have so many hours in a day. So you, yeah, it's definitely the quandary. And I mean, I remember when I started my company, it was me and a developer. That was it. I did all the project management. Um, we used to do templates, so we had a designer create a bunch of templates, but I was doing everything. So I mean, a lot of companies are kind of starting off, but you just have to figure out a way to do it. So what I did, I just worked a lot. Yeah. 
Um, there's, you know, Gary Vee, Gary Vaynerchuk says, um, in order for a business to succeed, they should work their asses off and don't buy stupid shit. That's what he says. So in terms of the growth, in terms of the business, how close have you been like? In terms of growing the company, who did you feel you needed? I started with a project manager. Okay. Yeah. The first person I, because I was working a while. I was doing all the sales, all the project management. So the first thing I, it was funny, I hired a project manager. I, I said, I, 10 hours, I, I'm going to hire you for 10 hours a week because I couldn't afford much more than that at the time. This is a long time ago. And she came in. She took 10 hours of, off my plate. I had her up to 40 hours a week in like three months. And then another three months later, I hired another project manager. Now I have six project managers. So it just kind of grows. You have to learn to delegate the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that you're not. My best, I'm, my strength is sales. That's what I, I should only be doing sales. And that's pretty much all I do right now. Absolutely. Um, OK, so let's talk about once you actually get a lead, what's the next step? The very, the, for us, the very next step is qualifying. I talked about that. So we have a, a handful of people who qualify leads as they come in. And it's kind of a part-time job for those people because of the fact that we have you know, a fair amount of leads coming in. So we have to spend as little time as possible on qualifying those leads. So we have a list of questions they ask them. Um, when I'm qualifying a lead, I, I ask like two or three questions and I get to budget, as long as they're not a jerk. If they're a jerk, I just say, hey, we're too busy. <laughs> and if, they are, if they're cool, the next thing is I ask a couple questions so they can see some value in what we're doing and then I really get to what their, what's their budget. And they'll say, I can't tell you my budget. And then I'll say, you know, we can't, um, you know, we, it's, we need to see if we're going to be a good fit. We have a certain minimum. And I, I try to get them to see that it's versus, you know, versus just kind of scaring away with that. Sometimes they may have the budget or it might be have close to the budget, and I can get them to see enough value to be willing to jump their budget up a little bit more to get within you know, what, what our budget would be. So qualifying is really important. Not only qualifying on budget, but again, if you went back to that slide I had and establishing the sweet spot, everything on that list we're considering. Is it you know, geographically, are they a good fit? Are they you know, within our services, the type of company, blah, blah, blah. So all those things are really, really important. Um, has anyone ever heard the term getting client buy-in? Sure. Yeah. So essentially what that means in every phase of the sales process, you could be initial call, needs analysis, could be presenting, uh, doing an you know, actual call to figure out, you know, ask certain questions. You could actually be presenting a proposal. What we like to do is we tell them what the objective is of that call. And if at the end of the call, you know, are, we're still in, in alignment, what would be the next step? And we'll say, is that okay for you? And they always say yes. Once they say yes, they're psychologically on the hook for that next step, if everything went well. So you don't have to, you ever have that experience, you do a really good call with someone, and then you're like into the next step with them, and it's a little bit awkward because you want to do this, this, or that. So you have to kind of set it up in a certain way. It kind of really eliminates that. Plus, it gets them psychologically thinking that I'm going to be taking the next step with the, this potential, uh, with this company. Um, and then bring in the right team members. Um, typically, what that means is developers. So we have, if there's any, if it's, if it's not a marketing site, a straight marketing site, I'll bring a developer in almost every call, even though I could probably handle it. The reason I do that is because the developer is very disarming for them. And they're speaking to someone who's asking questions who's not a salesperson. They know it's not a salesperson. And they automatically give up so much more information than they would than if it was just me. Plus, the developers are really good at, at asking questions that make them see, feel like we know what we're doing. So we, I almost always bring a developer into a call where there's, even if it's a basic shopping cart. Again, if I was, even if I was able to get that information on my own, I find it's really super, super helpful to have someone who's not a salesperson in that, in that situation. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's. Second party as well. Yeah. <laughs> and then the point is, I, I do that as much as I can, because the deal is, is that you don't want to have to do everything twice. So you talk to the client, now you got to go tell the developer, and maybe he says, well, that's not right, then you got to go to the client again. If, if you could just save so much time, if they can answer a few of the client's questions that are tech yeah, questions, so. I'm stuck. Yeah, we try to really limit as much as possible. We bring our web strategists in for a lot of calls, too, because they're able to really educate them on our process, which is focusing on the user experience and focusing on conversion optimization third as well. Part, right. Yeah, so third, third part, yeah, you, customer, and, and then, then the yeah. designer yeah. kind of comes in, closes it. And then the expert, so to speak, in that particular Oh, uh, you're the expert. Oh, no, I, I can't do anything. 
Um, he's a closer. Yeah. yeah. And then this is this is really focus, important. Focusing on pain points, there you really want to get them really frustrated with their current situation. So we'll ask a couple questions, find out what the problem is, and then we dig in. It's almost like if someone has a wound, you keep like poking it, <laughs> and it gets them really, really frustrated with what their with whether it be their current vendor, or their current you know CMS, or their current designer. Get them really frustrated with it. And it's really important for us to uncover on, a, on the deepest level possible what the problems are. Because our sales presentation is essentially focusing on how we address each of those real needs. So uncovering pain points is a critical part of that initial call. Um, and then, um, I don't have my glasses, so I have to look here, by the way. Um, specifications of the project, find, it, we have a, pretty, a couple of pretty in-depth questionnaires of finding out exactly what they want. The worst, worst thing is to find out you know, when we actually, after they sign a contract, sending you know, our questionnaire and they tell us they want all this stuff that wasn't mentioned during the sales process. And then, as you all know, their expectations are, hey, you didn't say you couldn't do it, just I assume you could. So it's, we ask a lot of questions at, at this phase in the process, and almost every client really, really appreciates it, that we're going as deep as possible in understanding and discerning what their needs are as early as possible. That goes back to buy-in Absolutely, absolutely. And then um, this is important. So the next step after we do our needs analysis, analysis is presenting the proposal. And it's really important for us that we have all the decision makers on the call, that call. Otherwise, if, let's say you're speaking to the, uh, you know, let's say you're speaking to a marketing assistant or something like that. Who's going to bring it to the marketing director? Who's going to bring it to the CEO? It's a, total, it's a total waste of time. Not to say we don't do it, but we ask them a question I ask. You may have heard this. In addition to yourself, who, who else is involved in the decision? And they'll say, you know, my boss or blah, blah, blah. And then, so we'll, we'll say, you know, we, it's going to be, we, we take kind of an assumptive close, close with this. What's, you know, we, we really need, you know, your, your boss or whomever to be on the call. And in some cases, if they say they can't be, we say, I will we'll actually say, I'm sorry, we can't go to the next step. We're that adamant about it because, you know, our time is valuable. And if we're spending an extra hour, you know, putting together a proposal and presenting it to someone that, has very, very, if any, influence other than p passing it to the next person, it's a waste of time. So what I say, if, they'll say, if they say something like, I don't think he'll be here, I'll say it's really difficult. Our process is fairly unique, and there's a lot of value in what, we, what, we, you know, what we offer, but it's almost <coughs> impossible for anyone who's not us to convey it to someone else. And it usually works, so it's worth asking. And you have to look at you know, the project. You have to look at you know, the experience you've had with them in the past. You have to look at what level they are to make a determination if it's still worth presenting to that person if they can't bring the decision maker in. But usually, I, it's amazing to me how many times I ask. They'll let, at the beginning, they'll say, I'll be, I'll be the one who will be gathering information. And then I ask, I'll say, I, need, I really need the decision maker there. And in eight out of 10 cases, they'll just do it. If I hadn't asked, they wouldn't have done it. So it's definitely worth, definitely worth asking. Um, so next thing is, what we do is we actually break up our, the next our proposal into two documents. We have just a regular PowerPoint deck we use on a kind of a high level to present you know, what we're, our proposal. So we have this, and we actually send them a more formal proposal. It makes it a lot easier in a conversation, whether it be remotely or face-to-face, -to, -face, to actually present in a very simple, simple way on a deck. Um, so the first thing uh, we do is, if on the previous call, if they say to us, um, if they say to us, just send us a proposal. I mean, has anyone ever had that happen to you? Yeah. yeah. What do you guys say? No. no. I, we don't do that. Sorry. We absolutely, absolutely will not do that. If they say, just send us a proposal, say, we, our policy is that, you know, we, you know it, it's fairly difficult to exp understand our process and our deliverables and our scope without having gone through a presentation. And when, again, nine out of 10 cases, they'll say, yeah, I understand. Every once in a while, you'll get someone who's kind of a stickler that says, you know, we don't have, you know, we're not going to, we don't, we're not going to waste the time or spend the time. That's what they're really saying. And I'm not going to waste the time, but they're not going to waste the time. Yeah. So if they don't, if they won't take the time to actually, you know, sit down to review the proposal with us, then we just won't, we'll just, it ends right there. The bigger problem is if you do a proposal, basically you've given them the answers and they can go to somebody else and say, hey, they could do that anyways, but yeah. But uh, it's more of more of the chances of closing the deal go up a thousand percent if you if you actually get to present it. And the next point is face to face. If you get a if I get a face to face meeting, I pretty much assume that my closing ratio doubles. 
That's right. Yeah, so I almost always go for a face-to-face -face meeting. I try never to, uh, we have an office down in San Diego where I live North of San Diego, so I try never to leave my house unless I'm going to meet with a client, meet with a client to make that presentation. Um, so if I, you know, what, what, what about a 15 minute phone call it turns into an hour meeting, you can develop rapport, you can answer questions, you can get all the visual cues. Usually, you get five yeah. minutes left in the whole presentation. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, okay. Um, I'm just going to just read these things. Um, uh, focusing on hot buttons, emphasizing our differentiators, and always, always be closing. <laughs> yes. So uh, next thing is our proposal. Well, you know, we, it, when you're sending your proposal over, it's really important if you have, if we don't really use case studies, but some people do, sending case studies that are relevant for that project. Um, we always send re all links to our reviews versus like testimonials, they're, they're much, less bias, so we probably have 100 really good reviews on a variety of sites. We're always sending reviews and links to reviews for our best clients and so forth and so on, and it makes a huge difference. So once you start to build, you wouldn't want to send one review over, you know, we'll send a link to a site with, you know, 20 or 30 reviews. Um, and then portfolio samples are, you know, really helpful. So, uh, um, you know, samples especially that are relevant to what they're looking for are really helpful if you have a good portfolio. And finally, this actually helps a lot. If you have a company that's budget conscious, especially a start, we work with a lot of start funded startups, we'll offer installment plans, especially if we're hosting and maintaining their website that they can't take the site away from us. We'll do, I'll actually do 12 installments, which seems kind of ridiculous. My, my condition is that it has to be on a credit card, it has to bill monthly, does automatic, and I probably have, we have probably 20 projects right now that we're billing you know, a very, fairly extended plan. So let's say it's a $10,000 project, they're doing, you know, instead of paying 10 grand or five grand or even three grand up front, they, companies really appreciate that. And it, I get a lot of deals that I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't offer installment plans. Following up is really critical. Um, obviously, it's, there's a saying in sales, it takes on average eight contacts to convert a prospect to a client, and it really is true. The follow-up could be a simple email, it could be a phone call or whatever, something really simple. But if you're not following up with your prospects, it's, it's uh, almost impossible to have a successful business. Is anybody not have a, is anyone, are you guys all using a CRM? Yeah. It's really, really important to have a CRM to track. Let's say you're getting 10 leads a week, and you got, over the course of a month, that's 40 leads. Over the course of six months, that's hundreds of leads. If you're not, if you're not tracking every single conversation, the next step, action items, and so forth and so on, it's almost impossible to do without a CRM. Um, timing your follow-up is really important. And every time I follow up, I, add, I hold back a little bit, a few things during the sales process, and I have this kind of uh, certain things that I'm adding value with every single follow-up. Like, by the way, your website's going to be GDPR compliant, or by the way, this, this, or that. So I'm incrementally building value with every single follow-up. So it's not just, hey, Joe Blow, can you give me your business yet? It's, more of, it's a more, much more strategic approach in the follow-up. And then, um, obviously, adding them to our existing email marketing campaign and following up with our existing clients is really important as well. And we, especially when we have time, we're able to do that. So I actually breezed through the last couple of slides. Do we have time for questions? Two minutes. Okay. Anybody have any questions? I'm sorry. He's going to give you a microphone and a ball. <laughs> um, you were talking about that one project that went 150 hours over. Uh, when that happened, did you decide, did you find the error of why you guys went so far over, and did you decide to keep that client, or that that client was going to continue to be a problem? We actually, we almost always keep our clients. If we're bidding on it, even if we have to eat it, we'll keep our clients. Plus, they're a bigger company, and we're going to have a long-term, we're maintaining their site, and, and they, I was able to get 50 more hours out of them. Um, our developer dropped the ball and he way underbid it. It was, a, it, was a, it was a WordPress conversion from another CMS to WordPress, and it just turned out to be a And there was all these forms that had to be GDPR compliant. It was just went on and on. So we did end up, we're, on, we're actually launching it. We're doing the migration on Monday, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. Most of their business is in the EU. I don't need the microphone. I can talk. Um, well, they're taping it, so they want it okay. for that reason. So the clients that you do installment plans for, do you host that on your own server? WP or? Engine servers. Do, but, have, I mean, you yeah. have control over it Absolutely. at all times? Okay. Yeah, well, we, uh, half our business, well, uh, two thir a third of our business is 
We have like 550 sites we're maintaining on WP Engine servers. Okay. Uh, what we really just do are the plugin updates. We did that at one point, and the client ran away with our code before he finished paying for it because it was on his server. Yeah, we ours. wouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. They have to pay in full before we turn it over. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? That's about time. Okay, we're done. Thanks, everyone. Bye.